Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar, Frog, Will, and Butler, CI Pipelines for Modern DevOps. Thank you for deciding to spend your lunch break with us. So before we start, just a few details. Uh, please remember to ask all your questions in the question box, and we will make sure to answer them at the end of the session. And just a little reminder of the events that we are doing this month. So we'll be in the Copenhagen on Thursday for the code conference. We'll be at the Jenkins World Europe in Nice from October 23rd to 25th. And we'll also be in London for the Velocity Conference from October 30th, 31st. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Jonathan, who will guide you through this webinar. Hey, John? Hello, thank you, Nea. So, hello everyone. I'm John, uh, or Recolor Jonathan. Uh, I'm Solution Engineer at GFROG. And just to introduce myself as a social engineer, my uh, job consists in uh, talking with customers and make them happy uh, by using our product. So training them, helping them to use our product in the best way in order to lead the DevOps, the DevOps transformation in their company. Uh, if you're not familiar with JFrog, here is a, a very quick picture just to, to mention what we are doing. Um, this picture, it's a very simple one just to illustrate our vision, which is uh, helping you to bring uh, your software from code to production. So in this diagram, we see uh, to illustrate the code, the so Jenkins and Git as CI server and uh, source code repository, but it can be replaced by Bamboo, TeamCT, uh, TFS, whatever you want. And for the production, we use Kubernetes, but of course, uh, not everyone is running production on Kubernetes, so it's just an illustration. What is important here is uh, the green part uh, with all the JFrog products. I'm sure some of you are already familiar, at least with Artifactory, uh, which is our universal um, binary repository manager. So basically, the place where you can manage all dependencies you consume for your builds and where you can store and manage all your own generated artifacts. Uh, in parallel of Artifactory, we have also the popular um, JFrog bin tray. Uh, and I'm sure most of you are already using bin tray. Maybe you don't know it, but as an example, when you perform a brew install on your Mac, in fact, you are fetching all packages from bin tray itself. The same when you are using uh, Android Studio. Almost every dependencies, every packages are coming from JSON term, bin tray, and so on. On top of that, we can see JFrog X-Ray, uh, which is our security and governance tool. So X-Ray is a tool to uh, perform uh, um, a redundant uh, analysis on binaries to detect all embedded packages within your own packages and to, to check any uh, security issue or license issue regarding rules you implement within X-Ray. On top of it, you have Mission Control, our centralized uh, dashboard for monitoring and then managing of all JFrog products. That comes with uh, Insights, a tool for data-driven DevOps that can aggregate data from your CI server, uh, your source code repository, your artifactory, your X-ray, uh, from several projects in order to have uh, real-time indicators and tendencies about your project. Last but not least, on the bottom, we can see uh, the access uh, products. Uh, this one is uh, a bit hidden within uh, our products, but it helps uh, in order to federate all security um, implementation in all JFrog products. So to sync your users, your groups, your permission, tokens, etc., across all your projects, all your data centers, etc. Very important for us is to be able uh, to address universal uh, uh, technology or universal uh, uh, stacks. So all our tools are built to be universal. Uh, we are multi-cloud, which means that we have, for example, a SaaS offer available for Azure, uh, Amazon, and Google Cloud. And you can also install almost all products, in fact, all except Bintray on-premise. 
and ecosystem is because we have uh, tight integration with uh, almost all CI servers with dedicated plugins and build tools and so on. Uh, very quickly uh, on this side, on this slide, because it's not about logo brands uh, and the amount of customers, but it's more about compliance. Um, what I want to, to show you in this slide is the um, customer's uh, landscape. So the J4 customer's landscape. We have customers in almost any kind of, uh, of area. And remember, we are working on DevOps transformation with them. So we have customers that you can expect in the DevOps launch field like Netflix, Oracle, Google, um, and Twitter, and so on. And some more, um, let's say, uh, industrial uh, companies are with more legacy and that are also uh, in uh, a transformation in, um, in the process of adopting the DevOps transformation or that are already um, uh, in a DevOps uh, approach. And basically with all those customers, what I'm doing every day is talking about pipeline. How to build a pipeline, it can be on the storage aspect, on um, the data transfer aspect, the security aspect of the pipeline, uh, or the whole process, how to build the whole pipeline, the whole workflow for their company. At the end, all the discussion are about pipelining. So I would like to take a step backward and to have a look to what is a pipeline. A pipeline by definition is a pipe with a set of inputs. In software industry, uh, the inputs are external libraries you consume from known and unknown uh, committers and maintainers, and your own code, what you write. And the output of a pipeline of this pipe is your production, or at least the delivery that's what you deliver to your customers, and what if you're not the one that run your production. And the pipe itself is just uh, a place where you merge those inputs in order to produce your output. But we all know that it's not just a pipe. It's not as simple in uh, real life. And in fact, in real life, uh, building a pipeline looks more like a water treatment plant, where you have an input, uh, water, and you have an output, clean water. But in the middle, you have several stages several uh, processes in order to monitor uh, each step that your water, what, it, what flows in your pipe is clean and safe in order to distribute something uh, that is under control and that is as clean as possible for your customer. You want to be sure that it's uh, safe for them to consume your output. Why I'm saying that as an introduction, it's because I really believe that to understand complex things, you need to understand and to perceive patterns behind the complex uh, uh, problematics. And a common pattern behind uh, the pipelining uh, topic is the staging model pattern. Um, in literature, you can find different uh, naming for this pattern, it can be the delivery model, uh, the staging model, but here at JFrog, it's our representation. So there are three main entities to know in this, uh, in this pattern uh, that I will introduce now. The first entity is uh, the maturity level, the maturity level, sorry, or the environment or the stage. So here in this diagram, we can see we have four different stages uh, that are four different maturity levels within our pipeline, integration, system testing, staging, and production. In real life, you will always have production, and it's preferable to have a staging or production mirror, pre-production, something similar to your production. You might have integration, system testing, but you can have also uh, additional uh, stages within your pipeline. 
just keep in mind it's uh, a sequence of stages that represent the maturity level of your artifacts. The operation of moving from one stage to the other one uh, is called promotion. Uh, so moving from integration to system testing is a promotion. And a promotion is done if quality requirements defined in a quality gate are it. So a quality gate, the third concept, is a set of requirements to be met uh, to be able to perform a promotion. So keep in mind, maturity level or stages, promotion to move from one step to, to the other one, and quality gates that are, are the keeper for the isolation between uh, environments. When you work with uh, such kind of pipeline, uh, CI server has a very important role. Uh, it's interesting to go back a bit in history and uh, to remember uh, when we started to work with CI servers such as uh, Hudson uh, 15 years ago or 12 years ago, uh, the first attempt with CI server was to provide a first shared build environment, a place where the build is agnostic from the committer, from the developer who made the last change. So a place with a, a, common, uh, a, a common environment with the same context for build for all the team. But the CI servers evolved a bit during the past few years. And in fact, it started to, they started to do more than uh, simply building, passing some unit tests, uh, some code coverage, and sending uh, a fast feedback to the developer. They started to implement some logical in order to uh, validate the quality gates by calling external tools like uh, Sonar, uh, Sonar Cube Server, as an example, or JFrog X3, or any uh, tool that will implement the set of requirements, will send the results. And based on these results, the CI server will choose to move forward with a promotion or to, to roll back the build, to fail it, etc. So it's the CI server become an orchestrator of your pipeline. And because it's an orchestrator and it's integrated with all your external tools, it's also a, a very good place to gather and to collect data and restitute data and feedback to your teams. A second tool uh, that is uh, in use in this kind of pipeline is the binary repository, which is in use as a backend, first of all, to provide a way to guarantee immutable builds. When you have this kind of, of pipeline, what you want is to build only once uh, your packages and then move them from environment to environment using the same deployment method and same deployment uh, way to deploy and to provision all your environment integration and production and staging system testing etc uh, the binary repository gives you also uh, support for metadata in order to qualify your artifacts to give to add more information on them this artifact has, has passed this test in this environment, this day, with this team, et cetera, et cetera. All of these to have traceability. Also, if you are using a good binary repository, it should protect your binaries, protect them from corruption, and also make sure they are coherent and you deal with them in an atomic way. When you perform a promotion of a build, you should promote all artifacts that are part of the build, dependencies and generated artifacts. And based on the security model, it will also guarantee isolation between the different environments. As an example, in ArtFactory, you can use different repositories or different uh, permission per environment in order to make sure that what is uh, deployed in production is what is mature enough to be in production and has been tested in staging before. So for today, I choose to use uh, Jenkins and Art Factory. 
in order to illustrate uh, this uh, approach. And why I made this choice, it's because, simply because, first of all, I'm working at GFOG, so Art Factory makes sense. And Jenkins is uh, the most popular CI server I see with our customer and the community. And uh, also we have a very, very good plugin uh, for Jenkins, an Art Factory plugin for Jenkins. Uh, for the demo, I built a very, very simple web app. It's a single uh, page app uh, with a backend uh, built with uh, Java Gradle, a front end with Node NPM. And as we are in 2018, I'm generating a Docker image. The, uh, so everything will run in a Docker container. And this image, uh, my Docker app image, will be based on uh, another image that I built in a separate pipeline and called Docker Framework. This image is based on Nginx. So this is the official Nginx Docker image. And I will add um, the JDK 8 on top of it in order to build my Docker Framework image. This is the first pipeline. I have a pipeline to build my Gradle app, one for NPM, and last but not least, a pipeline to aggregate everything, so to build Docker app, so taking the Docker uh, framework image and adding the Java and Node uh, uh, results. And just for the fun, because we are in 2018, almost, uh, 2018 is almost over, we will, at the end, uh, generate um, a hand chart in order to deploy everything on Kubernetes. Uh, to be honest, for a single web page, it's a bit uh, oversized architecture. And I will call it a conference-driven development. So don't do it at home for a so simple uh, use case. It's a waste of time, in my opinion. Demo. How to do it? So very simple. Once you have the Art Factory plugin installed in your Jenkins, just have to configure it from Jenkins. You should you choose uh, a nice name for your Art Factory server ID. Provide the URL. You use a uh, uh, plugin's credential to connect to it, and that's it. And then let's have a look to our pipelines. Uh, this is uh, first the Gradle pipeline. I'm starting it. So of course uh, with a Git uh, with a Git uh, checkout. But then I create an Art Factory server instance. So simply with the Art Factory plugin, I say I want to create an Art Factory server instance. From the plugin configuration, I'm using the nice name I provided in the, in the configuration page. Then I create a Gradle build instance. So again, with the Art Factory plugin, and I configure it to say every dependencies will be resolved at the build time from the repository Gradle release. This is a virtual repo on my art factory that aggregates several uh, local and remote repository in order to provide all needed dependencies to my, uh, for my development. Uh, but more important here, uh, I set up the deployer, so where I will deploy and publish all generated artifacts after my build in art factory. And so it will be done in the repository Gradle dev local. So a development repository. The next stage in my pipeline is to run the build. So it's simply a call to the, uh, on my Gradle build object, a call to the run method, passing the uh, build Gradle file. And the tasks are clean and art factory publish. Art factory publish will call uh, the build task and all subsequent tasks. Important here is that the result of this call is a build information object. And this build information object, I will publish it into Art Factory with the publish build info uh, method on the Art Factory server object. So here I'm publishing the build information object. 
after checking my uh, quality gates and uh, the set of requirements for uh, the promotion, the next promotion, I'm running a promotion on Artifactory uh, using the plugin again. So it's just by using a promotion configuration object that define where I'm saying, in fact, I want to promote this build name with this build number. This is my unique ID. And I want to do a promotion for a target repository Gradle release local, which means that all generated artifacts will be moved to this repository. Remember, I deployed them at the build time in Gradle dev local. After this promotion, the, they will be in Gradle release local, a different repository. And also, I will attach a comment and a status to my build. So the status will be released. Um, other optional parameters here is uh, the copy parameter set to true, which means that, in fact, I won't perform a, a move operation of my artifact, but a copy. So I will have my artifacts, generated artifact, both in Gradle dev local and Gradle release local, which is free in terms of storage for Artifactory because it's used a checksum uh, based storage. It's just a record in the database. And last but not least, include dependencies is set to true, which means that Artifactory will pick all dependencies used at the build times from all the repositories where those dependencies are located and it will make a copy that will be uh, uh, saved in the Gradle release local repository. So at the end, in Gradle release local repo, I will have all my generated artifacts, but, all, but also all dependencies used at the build time. And here I have my immutable build. I have everything used and produced by my build. And then, the call to the promote uh, method with my promotion config object. And it looks like this. So what I'm gonna do is to show you the pipeline in my Jenkins. So here's the pipeline. Uh, this is where I'm configuring my uh, Gradle executor objects, building my project. You can see the publication of artifacts in Artifactory. And here's the build information. We'll jump on it. Here you can see I'm within Artifactory. So I have the list of all builds that happened for this project. Here I can see that for the last build, the 32, I have one module uh, published that contains two artifacts and uh, 34 dependencies. For this build, I can compare it with the previous one and see what artifact changed, uh, what dependencies change or not in my build. I can see the release history. So here I will have uh, a trace of all promotion that happened on this particular build. So I can see my promotion to release with the command. Uh, it has been done by the Jenkins CI Artifactory user. I can see it happens on the 19th of September. And I can go in detail for uh, generated artifacts. Just go in my Artifactory tree browser, make sure I'm in the right repo. And here in the Builds tab, I will be able to see, OK, this artifact has been published by my build uh, 32 of this project. And I can uh, go back again. Yeah. OK. So, that's for Gradle. This is something we are doing for years. Now let's have a look for uh, Docker itself. Uh, the NPM pipeline is almost the same as Gradle. It's for developers, same concept, easy. Now for Docker, uh, my pipeline looks like this. I'm creating an Artifactory server object. Then uh, I instantiate a build information object a bit in advance for a little trick I will show you uh, in the next slide. And then instead of creating a Gradle build object, I create a Docker client from the Artifactory plugin. This is the only difference for now. Here is a small trick uh, I mentioned about the build information object. 
insights uh, from my Docker image. Here is the pipeline for the Docker framework Docker image. Remember, I want to add the JDK 8 within this image. And I want to track this JDK as a dependency of my build. So for that purpose, I will use a download specification file, uh, where I say I want to download this list of files that match this list of patterns. In fact, I have only one, and it's an hard-coded one. You can use Wildcard uh, to have more uh, generic resolution. But here, I'm simply asking to get this version of the GDK for my art factory. I want to save it locally in this folder, and I perform my download command. And you can see in the download command, I'm using the download spec, but also the build information object. So here's the plugin, the Art Factory plugin will populate the build info object to track that this file, this JDK targeted, is a dependency of the current build. Next stage is the build. Here I'm doing an additional step in comparison of the, with the previous pipeline that I'm collecting all environment variables. And I will show you why it can be very useful. Then something very, uh, very familiar for people uh, playing with Docker in Jenkins. I create a new tag for my image with the image name, the tag, which is my build number. I'm building my Docker image. And in the next stage, I push my image in Art Factory using the plugin, using the build information objects. So I'm pushing my image in Docker dev local repository. And within the build information object, I will have all uh, layers used I, as a, a dependency, tracked as dependency, all generated layers and the manifest JSON as generated artifacts. And so I'm publishing the build information object in Art Factory. Uh, then I'm doing an optional step. It's not mandatory. Uh, and in fact, it can be uh, a debate here, uh, but so the debate is about latest. Uh, is it good or not to use latest, or does, uh, is latest evil um, in Docker? My point of view is that Docker allows you to use latest, so we are providing a way to use latest if you want to use it, and now it's uh, up to you to use it or not. But the idea here is that with Art Factory, you can, you can generate a latest or a new tag of an existing image uh, without any need to pull the image, tag it locally, and push it again with a new tag. You can do it sim by a simple call to the REST API. So it's uh, the Art Factory REST API. I'm saying within the repository Docker dev local, I want to perform a promotion of a Docker image. And the promotion will happen within the same repository. It will be a copy. And what I'm going to do is to uh, change to have a copy of this actual tag, the one that match my build number, in order to have a tag latest. So I will have a tag latest, which will be a copy of my actual uh, Docker framework image I just pushed. Uh, in the same repository. And again, after quality gate, test, etc., I will perform my promotion. You can see the promotion is the same as the one I, I did for the Gradle project. Uh, the build name, build number, the target repository, uh, the status. Here I'm not, I don't include dependencies in my promotion because it's kind of nonsense. Uh, in Docker, all dependencies are coming within the layer that are embedded. So in my case, they are already tracked in the build information. I don't need to, um, to copy them in a Docker registry. And it will be a nonsense also to copy uh, a targeted in the JDK in my Docker registry. And so I'm performing my promotion. So, here is uh, my pipeline, how it looks like. So let's have a look to this pipeline. OK. 
line and let's have a look to the docker framework last one <clears throat> so the setup the resolution of uh, jdk you can see it comes from art factory uh, it's now part of the build information as a dependency here i'm doing my docker build uh, what is interesting here is that my docker file itself start with a from nginx which is coming from my art factory this is a repository on art factory docker registry on art factory uh, so then it's simply adding the jdk and starting nginx pushing the image in art factory and build information and here i will jump on art factory so the same as uh, what I show you for Gradle, here we have two modules. We have one that contains one dependency, the JDK, and one that contains the image itself, so all the layers, the manifest. Here I can see in the remote, I have the uh, Nginx la uh, layers that are um, for the base image I use to build my Docker framework image. Uh, I didn't show you the environment variables. So I told you here in this pipeline, I collect the environment variables. So I can see all variables in my CI server, like the build, information, the build name, the build ID, uh, the commit number uh, that triggers this build, etc. And I have also access to all uh, system variables. So all the variables in my uh, server itself and I can filter, as an example, an example I really like to very quickly see what was the Java runtime version installed uh, on my CI server at the build time. Very useful also because I have the build, the diff tab where I can compare uh, the difference in uh, environment variables between two builds. Also because I'm on a Docker image, I will show you on our factory. Uh, the native package you, uh, viewer here allows you to look for, for example, for Docker. For all Docker images, um, you have access to, depending on your profile. So here I'm an admin, so I have access to all images in my art factory. I can find my Docker framework here. I can see that this image is both in Docker dev and Docker prod local. The amount of downloads, the amount of tags, the last modification date. And if I go in detail, I will see all the different tags. Uh, a, a quick check shows me that latest is both in dev and prod, same for 89. And with the digest, I can see that 89 is the latest. It's the same uh, image. I can go in more detail for a particular image and see all information about the layers. Cool. So now we have a pipeline for Docker, for uh, my framework, for my application. It's exactly the same. The one from the end chart is the same concept uh, for Gradle, for NPM. So if I start to count it, it's NPM, Gradle, Docker, and we have four different technologies. But I would say it's kind of hipster technologies. They are all kind of modern technology. And why I'm saying that is because when I'm on, on site uh, with customers performing the training, I used to show this kind of pipeline. And most of people are really happy with that. And there are a lot of questions. But there are almost always one or two guys in the back of the room. And those guys say something like, yeah, it's cool, your stuff, but you know, I'm not a hipster, I'm a real developer. Uh, you know, I'm coding in C or in C++. And you know, C++ is a thing. It's a real thing. It's not uh, as simple as your uh, fancy uh, Docker thing. And the main reason why it's a, it's a thing it's dependency management. It's not the only reason, but dependency management can be very difficult in C++ world. 
Um, as an example, if you have this kind of project where you want to work on P, and P depends on D and G, and you have this graph of dependency. If someone change something on uh, the library A, and you want to be able to work on this last change on the project P, you will have to rebuild the entire chain of dependency. So the idea here is to be able to orchestrate the builds and to orchestrate them in the uh, smartest way you can find. Because here it's a simple graph. Most of real C, C++ projects, they have thousands of libraries or millions of libraries. And in order to build such kind of graph, you want to be able to run parallel jobs when you can or sequential job when you cannot parallelize your jobs. So here the idea is to have a first uh, job that will be an orchestrator, the multi-build uh, Jenkins task. This job will be uh, in charge when there is a change on A to uh, build the, comp the dependency graph and to orchestrate the build of each single library with a simple build job. So on a change on, on A, the multi-build will say, okay, in order to, uh, to take in account this change, I need to build A. Then I will build B. But when B, when B will be built, I know that can, I can run in parallel D and F in order to optimize the build time. And when F will be built, I will be able to build G. And now the question is, how can I generate this uh, dependency graph? And in fact, there is a tool for that called Conan. Uh, Conan is a package manager for C and C++ written in, P in Python by C and C++ by, uh, people. It's not uh, a project in Gradle or in NuGet uh, that try to mimic Gradle approach or NuGet approach for C++. It's a real C++ tool built by C++ people to address C++ use case. And here are my pipeline. The first one, the orchestrator pipeline, the one in charge to uh, orchestrate the single build uh, job. I'm starting with an artifact server object and a Conan client object. Because yes, Conan is, uh, is included within Artfactory. It's supported by Artfactory. Then in order to configure my Conan client, I just say, here is the repository where you will get all your dependencies, Conan, prod, local. And then I'm just uh, uh, triggering all the tasks uh, depending on the build order. So it looks a bit more complex than the previous pipeline. It's C and C++, it's, uh, it's a thing I told you. In fact, it's just uh, getting all the different profiles uh, I want to address. And the most important is the call to this method, get build order for live. And what this method is doing is basically this single line, calling the Conan uh, method BO for build order on my library for the current profile. The current profile might be the current architecture, the current OS, the current compiler, etc. And the result is a JSON file that gives me the list of uh, libraries I need to build, but not the, sequ the sequential list, also what libraries I, I can build in parallel. And so depending on the results, I trigger the jobs in parallel or in sequence. And so the library pipeline, so for each single library, I have this Conan pipeline where I'm creating my Artifactory server, the Conan client, configuring, I configure the Conan client. I create the Conan uh, package with the create command from Conan. 
and I push uh, the library, the Conan package in my Art Factory server. This generates a build information object, environment variables, publish the build info. And after the query date is, uh, is passed, I can promote my build, my Conan build, so the, my Conan library. And this is exactly the same I did for Gradle, NPM, Docker, Elm. I'm passing the same parameters, moving my artifacts from dev to staging and so on. And at the end, if I look at my uh, Jenkins, it looks like this. Uh, on a change on A, I'm building A, then B, F, and here, because of uh, the result of the build holder Conan by Conan, I know that I can build in parallel G and D, and so I'm doing it. For people that are still awake, you can see that I'm not simply building every library in a, a, um, a single library. Each time I'm building each library for two different architecture, 32 and 64 bytes. It's. Why? It's because, again, C++ is a thing. If you know that you want to address your project in different architecture, in fact, a change on A needs to uh, trigger build of A and the entire uh, graph of dependency for both architecture. And in fact, it's a bit more complex because if you know that your target is not only about architecture, but also about different uh, operating systems like uh, Linux, Windows, and different uh, compiler like GCC6, uh, CLang, etc., you will have for each different variant build the entire dependency graph. And in fact, C++ can be a nightmare because you also have this kind of uh, very famous uh, libraries like OpenSSL, a uh, uh, very popular one, that have this concept of uh, conditional build requirements. So when you build a package that relies on OpenSSL, depending on if you are on Windows or on Unix system, you won't have the same dependencies. On Windows, you will depend on Strawberry Pearl. You won't on Unix. But on Unix, you might depend on the lib or not. It's conditional. And so at the end, you have so many variants in C++. You have debug release, architecture, OS type, the compiler, the compiler version, and conditional build requirements, which means that it can, this graph of dependency and the amount of builds and the total build time to address all the different variants can be uh, uh, very, very long. So it's, this is where it's very important to be able to parallelize and to optimize uh, how you uh, orchestrate all your jobs. And this is where I came with uh, an idea and where hipsters can help barbarians. So what I did is uh, a simple forge in order to provision in my art factory some dockerized Conan environments in order to address all my target environments uh, for my C++ packages. So I have some Docker images for, with GCC7, some with CLang, uh, some for uh, GCC6, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see they are not all at the same maturity level because this forge is also uh, following the uh, staging pattern model. So I need to qualify my images in order to be able to use them in order to populate my Conan uh, continuous delivery pipelines. And in the Conan pipeline, I added uh, an additional uh, job, which is simply doing this, looking for the list of target environments. So for that purpose, I'm using AQL, Art Factory AQL language. And with this simple call, I'm simply asking to Art Factory, tell me in your Docker prod local, uh, what is the list of Docker images you have for Conan? Based on the results, I'm 
launching in parallel uh, the multi-build task I showed you before. So here I'm launching one for Conan GCC 6 and one for GCC 7. And what is done within this uh, each uh, dot here is the multi-build task. So this one, but within uh, a Docker container that comes with Conan and the right compiler, the right architecture, etc. And so here I'm then doing exactly what I showed you before. So within a Docker container with Conan compiler GCC 6, I will rebuild my A for both 32, 64, etc., etc. And each dot here is simply that a pipeline for a simple library that gets that configure your art factory object, build, upload in art factory, pass the quality gate, and promote your build and all rated artifacts. The conclusion, it's what I really want to show you in this webinar is it's not about the tools itself. It's more about uh, how to choose a tool in, in DevOps and especially in big company. Uh, in my opinion, and this is what I see in most companies that choose, the choice between tools is that a good tool should allow you to apply the same patterns, the same best practices in an agnostic way for any teams, any kind of technology within your company. In order to, to get familiar with the process because yes, at the end, all the single tools for testing, for qualifying will be different. but the approach, the practice, the, um, the practice, uh, the philosophy, the pattern are the same uh, independently from the technology you are using and the culture of each, each team. So, thank you, first of all. And I think it will time to address some questions. We don't have a lot of time for it, in fact. So, uh, I have one question about Conan. Uh, in which version of Art Factory uh, is Conan available? So uh, Conan is available in every maintained version of Art Factory. We introduced it uh, almost two years ago, if I'm not wrong. So all recent version of Art Factory. And if you are asking about licensing, uh, Art Conan is in all version from Pro to Enterprise of Art Factory. But also, if you are really interested in Conan, we have an Art Factory Community Edition, which is free and comes with uh, support for Conan. All right, I think we're running out of time. So uh, we'll make sure to answer all the other questions by email. So thank you, John, for this great session. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we'll be sending an email with the recording and all the relevant links in the next few days. And if you have any whatsoever questions, you can always reach out to us. Thank you again, and have a great rest of the day. Goodbye.